Hey everybody, Jeffrey Scott back here with you. Um, I want to talk about an important topic today. If you've been following my channel or anything I post, whether here at YouTube or um, on the Facebook page, you know that I'm very into the study of cellular senescence currently and how polyphenols can impact um, you know, those senescent cells and help us clear those. And senescence is part of the aging process and vis-a-vis -vis dietary polyphenols, is there a way that we can combat that? And the research looks like it's pretty positive that compounds like resveratrol, fisetin, or quercetin are pretty potent uh, senolytic compounds. But an issue I want to talk about today, and I've presented this before, uh, so some of this is going to be review, um, but then some of it I think is going to be new for you as well, is the bioavailability of these polyphenols, um, how much actually is getting to the tissue from what you're taking. Now, I encourage, um, you know, if you're into supplements, I, I think as we age, either uh, by... Ex um, altering your diet to include more fruits, berries, leafy vegetables, things like cucumbers. Um, those tend to be pretty rich in natural polyphenols, such as fisetin and quercetin. Um, but as we age, you know, and senescence starts to outpace, um, you know, uh, the clearance rate of those cells, it may be more beneficial to supplement your diet. Now that's completely up to you. It's between you and your uh, physician to determine if that's the right thing to do. But whatever supplement you utilize, I hope this video will force you to ask some questions about it, okay? Because what I'm gonna tell you is the bioavailability of many of these polyphenols is very poor. So whatever supplement system you decide to use, um, if you decide to use one, make sure you understand how they are formulated to improve that bioavailability. And we'll get into that as we progress today. But um, I kind of you know, gave away the ghost here. Um, polyphenols are very poorly absorbed. There's no question about that. So. Dietary polyphenols, as they exist in nature, tend to have sugars attached to them. We call them uh, glycosylated um, proteins, and this does a couple things. One, it improves their solubility. So more of the chemical, more of the compound is getting into solution, dissolving in the aqueous environment that is our stomach and ultimately our, um, our small intestines. Um, however, when you have that sugar attached to the compound, okay, um, it limits its ability to diffuse across a membrane. Okay, and if you think about how our body is set up, especially as foods, you know, transit out of the stomach and into the small intestine, where true absorption uh, starts to take place across the enterocytes in the small intestine, you need a more lipophilic molecule, okay? So once you get the, sh the compound in solution, okay, that's great. You've got relatively high solubility, but now I have to get it across a fatty membrane into my cells. So oftentimes what needs to happen is that that sugar needs to be cleaved off to form what we call an aglycone, okay? And that simply means, um, Think of it as just free fisetin or free quercetin, okay? It is not modified, it is not conjugated uh, with anything else. Now, these are very um, hydrophobic or lipophilic, fat-loving molecules in the aglycone form that can now diffuse through the plasma membrane and into the cell and give it a chance to traverse that bilayer um, and uh, through the other side into the capillary and or the uh, hepatic circulation, um, which will ultimately lead to bioavailability. So when that aglycone diffuses through, okay, the bilayer, okay, the lipid bilayer of the cell, it begins being acted on by a number of enzymes, 
Um, a lot of what passes through is actively pumped back into the intestinal lumen for later excretion. Um, and, and in fact, there's actually this, um, uh, this equilibrium state that forms between the amount of aglycone that stays in that enterocyte, in that small intestinal cell, uh, versus the amount uh, that is actively pumped out. So um, also there's many chemical reactions that occur in the cytosol of a cell. You can have O-methylation, you can have sulfur groups attached, you can have methylene groups attached, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, methyl groups attached, which change the hydrophilicity um, versus hydrophobicity balance. Um, because remember, you know, this drug or this compound needs to get through the other side of the cell. So it has to go through a membrane again to get into the capillary, the circulatory system on the other side, okay? Now, oftentimes what makes this beneficial and how we um, achieve a lot of the concentrations of the polyphenol that we do see in the plasma is because that a glycone becomes re-glycosylated, okay? And in that glycosylated form on the, um, on the luminal side of the um, enterocyte closest to the blood system, there are active transporters that will move that and shuttle it across the plasma membrane where it then can uh, diffuse into the circulation. Okay, and from there it can distribute to various tissues and organs. So, you know, what are these pumps? You know, I talk about enzymes, I talk about uh, these pumps, and they're very similar acting. Now, let's keep in mind what an enzyme is. An enzyme chemically modifies what we call a substrate, okay? Now, it does so without being consumed in the reaction itself. So, think of an enzyme and a substrate as kind of a lock and key type of mechanism. There's a very precise fit uh, in the cleft of an enzyme for a particular substrate, um, and it catalyzes a chemical reaction. It can conjugate, um, you know, methyl groups. It can conjugate more sugar groups. Uh, it can hydrolyze. Um, so uh, enzymes tend to end with the word ACE, not word, but the last three letters are ACE. So hydrolase, lipases, esterases. Okay, those are enzymes that chemically modify a substrate. The pumps that are helping us get that polyphenol, that glycosylated polyphenol across the luminal side of our enterocytes, those are similar to enzymes, but they're not chemically modifying anything. They're taking energy, they're cleaving either ATP or, or GDP, they're cleaving a phosphate or two to generate the energy, not to modify our substrate, our glycosylated polyphenol, but to spatially translocate it across the membrane into the other side. So um, that's functionally um, how the polyphenol, and that's a very simplistic uh, type of mechanism. In, in the lumen of the small intestine, or even in the um, stomach with very harsh acidic um, conditions, you tend to get a lot of hydrolysis, um, you know, a lot of cleaving of those phenolic rings um, that are present in the polyphenol. So you get a ton of different types of metabolites, okay? But ultimately, you want that aglycone, that non-sugar version of the physetin or the quercetin to diffuse through the cell. Okay, now keep in mind that's going to be counteracted by pumps trying to kick it out. And that's how a lot of pharmaceuticals um, are addressed as well by the body. You know, the body does not like those things um, typically. So it's going to try and flush as much of that out as you can. So then that uh, a glycone, once it gets through, can undergo a myriad of different chemical reactions and different modifications, um, including glyco uh, let's call it re-glycosylation, which puts it in a form now where it's more attractive for those pumps on the far side to actually work with us, pump that polyphenol across the luminal border um, 
of our enterocyte where it has an opportunity to get into the uh, circulatory system. Okay, so there are many design strategies. So you can see with the extensive metabolism and catabolism of these compounds, you can see to achieve the type of bioavailability that you need. Uh, we're talking micromolar. You need at least a micromolar concentration or better to reach a meaningful, clinically relevant dose of the polyphenol to the tissues. So if we're developing a supplement, right, you've got to find a way to increase that bioavailability to protect those molecules as long as you can, protect those molecules from those uh, enzymes and some of the harsh conditions that that molecule is going to encounter as it traverses through the stomach into the small intestine and ultimately into the colon. And that's where I want to talk about galactomannans. I speak a lot about senolytic activator for my friends at Life Extension. And they found a very creative way to increase the bioavailability of fisetin in their formulation. And that is with the use of compounds called galactomannans. You know, these are natural polysaccharides and they come from a number of different sources. And they're basically just long chains of mannose molecules, which is a sugar, that have side chains of galactose, which is another sugar. And when you put these in solution, they're very water soluble, but they change the rheological properties of the solution. And they form what we refer to as hydrogels. Hydrogels are an interesting drug delivery system that uh, have been employed for, uh, especially in cancer therapeutics, you see a lot of hydrogels being employed. And if I put fisetin in the middle of this hydrogel, that hydrogel is going to do two things for me. One, it's going to greatly enhance the solubility of that aglycone version of fisetin, which, as I mentioned previously, it's more hydrophobic and it's more likely to diffuse through the plasma membrane. Two, when that drug, when that polyphenol, when that fisetin is in, surrounded uh, by this hydrogel of sugars, right, it prevents enzymes from accessing the polyphenol, from accessing the fisetin, and carrying out those chemical modifications that it would normally do if it was free, um, you know, in the environment. So what these galactomannans, what these long sugar polymers, as they interact with each other, they form this web. And I mentioned previously with an enzyme, think of it as a lock and key type of mechanism. Now, there's very specific orientations of that enzyme and of that substrate as they come together for this to work. Now, what that hydrogel does is it provides really, it's a little more complicated than this, but it can provide a, a, a physical barrier, spatial barrier, um, that lessens the likelihood that that substrate and that enzyme are gonna be able to connect um, or have the necessary proximity or achieve the proper orientation for that enzymatic reaction to occur. So again, you're maintaining, you're protecting the life of that aglycone faucet, uh, fisetin. And as a result, um, you know, you're gonna get more of that aglycone uh, to the small intestine, to the large intestine, where a lot of absorption is going to take place. And, you know, ideally you're going to improve the bioavailability, bioavailability of that drug because you've kept it from being acted on by those hydrolases and esterases and methyl transferases, all of those things that serve to uh, slice and dice that polyphenol and create a myriad of different metabolites. And, and, and rather, we're getting that aglycone form delivered to, or at least a higher likelihood, that it's gonna be delivered to the surface of those cells that can internalize it and get it into the circulatory system. Okay, so semolytic activator, if, if you look at how they formulated the fisetin, there's really only 
I think it's eight milligrams of fisetin in a dose. That's a very small amount. But by utilizing the galactomannan hydrogel approach to protecting that polyphenol, they increase, they're able to increase the bioavailability of that drug to our tissues by 25 times. And that is going to get you uh, the above micromolar concentrations you need for that polyphenol to help you control your senescent cells. So I know that was kind of a complex, geeky chemistry presentation, and it's definitely more complicated than that. There are so many metabolites um, that are derived from polyphenol metabolism and degradation, and some of them might be active. You know, what is the true active form? You know, we talked about how fisetin can... Uh, um, you know, engage with uh, the PI3P construct and, and, and the AKT construct and how it works, right? And how it pushes a cell down an apoptotic pathway. Well, there are also active metabolites that may be doing different things and may be responsible for the diverse set of functions that you see um, by utilizing polyphenols. Um, in our bodies. So definitely always consider, I'd love for you to give senolytic activator a try. I think it's the best one on the market in terms of how they formulated. But if you use a different supplement, definitely look at what they are doing to control their fisetin degradation and fisetin metabolism and improve the delivery of that polyphenol. There are a number of different ways to do it. Different companies do it very differently. So definitely uh, keep that in mind when you're choosing a particular polyphenol supplement. It's very important. Thank you very much for watching. We'll look forward to connecting with you soon. Stay regenerative. Mm -hmm.